All right, let's get things started, everybody. Welcome back to Open West, day two. Who's, who's tired already? Yeah. I, I know, I recognize a few very bleary-eyed faces who went to the, uh, the PHP meetup last night at the Waffle House. That went until, what, one in the morning? <laughs> it was the only place where, you know, at a, at a conference, people have hangovers from waffles. Right? <laughs> a little different than your other tech conferences. Um, so, very glad to have you all back. We've got uh, a lot of great stuff going on today. Um, obviously, I mean, we're only one-third of the way done. Today's got excellent topics, and also want to remind people about some of the fun stuff happening tomorrow. While we don't have keynotes, the, tomorrow's day is very fun because it's opened up for a lot more of the hands-on type projects. So we have tracks where for youth to attend. Um, Victor's son is actually doing a great presentation, uh, learning to program. So bring your kids, have an opportunity to let them learn a little bit. The transistors hands-on area is going to be amazing with a lot of different opportunities to learn soldering, playing with Arduino, Arduino, and a lot of other fun stuff. Um, so some notes about things to, to do today. Um, one thing you'll notice is if you go to the uh, joined in page, uh, linked from our website, you can actually rate the, the sessions you've been on. Please do that. Let us know and let the presenters know. Give some good feedback and help them know if they can get these presentations better throughout the year at the user groups or maybe what they can do, what you can do next year to be even better. Um, for those who haven't gotten them yet, we do have the t-shirts at the registration desk. Go in and uh, get those. Uh, some other activities happening. Uh, the plug for the Linux users group uh, kind of is open to discuss. Thanks to Grant for starting it. So at, at lunch, it's a little uh, just meet up over in the cafeteria area. Get to know everyone face to face actually instead of just online. Um, after. After hours, there's going to be a Perlmongers dinner uh, after everything's over, so if you're interested in that, you can meet up with the, the Perlmongers throughout. And at 5 o'clock after the classes are over in the quad, which is the big grass area over here, there's a open social as well, so get to know some of the other attendees and uh, enjoy some food. So one of the things we really wanted to uh, give some thanks to right now and recognize that this conference would not be able to work without some of the volunteer labor we have. So with the volunteers who are actually in this room, please stand up. There's a, only a couple in this room because most of them are also getting everything out there ready for you. So everyone's noticed there's a lot of different volunteers that are helping everything from getting you registered, getting you in the door, getting your materials ready. I mean, you should have seen the amount of time people spent screwing these little tags onto your little bags Wednesday night. I mean, quite a, quite a long manual process. So some of the other great volunteer help we're getting is people are trying to record the different sessions and then after, of course, all this is over, there's a lot of work of trying to get those processed and ready so that everyone that we can will be available online. So over the next, uh, over the next while, I won't commit to any deadlines because we're all feeling tired already. Um, we will be getting these presentations online. You'll be able to find them from our website uh, and YouTube account. And of course, we'll be pushing that out through all the different social media. So please follow up and share this conference with your friends. Let them know what you learned, what you enjoyed. And hopefully, that'll get some more people interested next year. So to, to lead on to our first keynote, um, this person, of course, well, I'm sure nobody's really heard of this language or tool, right? It doesn't have any kind of strong opinions in the open source community. No one likes it or loves it anyway, you know? Um, never gets opinionated discussions. But in reality, of course, you know, everybody knows we, we jokingly have varying opinions in the open source community, what we love, what we don't love. But PHP has been a great mover for open source. And that's one of the reasons we wanted this presenter here today. Open source is often viewed as a very complex, very difficult to enter world, right? People are often afraid of the command line, or how do they get started? Well, our keynote today created a language that has really showed how you can lower the barrier to entry, where people could really get started and still create high performance tools without having to do as much of the, of the harder work ahead of time. They didn't have to necessarily have a CS2 degree to get started, but they could learn in the process. And this helped to bring in a large community of new people in the open source world who were then able to grow and thrive and create a, a rich ecosystem. And so 
I know the rest of the languages out there often look at, at PHP and have kind of that, that envy of, wow, you've got a really vibrant community, you've got so much traction going. And so many of us then had to adapt whatever we were doing to try and learn, because that's what open source does. And that's a really great thing. So to help them out, uh, Rasmus gave me a couple of, of pointers of interesting tips and stuff. So the first thing is he's probably the first person any of us have ever met that was born in Greenland. That's, that's pretty true. Which of course means he's Danish, but he actually travels with a Canadian passport. So we're getting a little complex there. Um, he's also best known for having created SQL's limit clause, which is the one I didn't know. So, without any uh, further ado, please welcome Rasmus. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Good morning. Whoops. I have to turn this on. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. Good morning, Utah. I still can't get over seeing the mountains with snow on it when I walk out the door in the mornings here. It's pretty awesome. Um, I'm online. Twitter is probably the best way to get a hold of me, um, see what I'm doing. I'm a hacker. I'm not a coder. Well, I am a coder, but I'm, I identify myself more sort of a hacker, half dreamer, half coder. Uh, there are lots of dreamers in the world. There are lots of coders in the world. I think the interesting things start to happen when you combine the dreaming and the coding. Sometimes it's in two people, and if you can get it into one person, it's a little bit more efficient, I think, because two people don't always get along, and it's, it's hard to spend 24 hours a day working on something with two people. Um, but that's where I think the, the really interesting thing happens, and that we see that a lot in the open source world, is when the hackers really decide to do something, then things move. Um, as I said, I was born in Greenland. That's me in Greenland playing with my dad's equipment up in the very northern part of Greenland in a town called Kekatasuak. This was the house we lived in. Middle of nowhere. <laughs> this is actually a recent photo, um, but it hasn't really been built up <laughs> since the 60s when I was living there. Um, this was the nearest town. A recent photo has grown a lot since I used to live there, which means there is now like 400 people instead of 100 people. <laughs> but it's pretty cool, right? The icebergs come floating by um, in the bay. That's sort of the view from the town, Main Street in the town. Anyway, so that's kind of a unique place that I came from. But I got started with PHP in 1993 when I saw Mosaic, first graphical browser. Before that, I was playing with uh, Gopher. I was doing some IRC work. I wrote a BBS. So back in the early, or back in the mid 80s, I guess, I wrote BBS systems. And then when the internet started to happen, before the web, um, I was playing with Gopher and, and other things like that. But it wasn't until Mosaic that I could really explain to my parents what I was doing. I couldn't explain Gopher to them that made no sense to them. But I could explain this. I could say, look, in five years, you're going to have a computer. You're going to be able to read the newspaper from Denmark every morning on your computer. And my parents would, no way. Well, we're never going to have a computer at home. Why, what, what's the point? This is, we don't see it. But now, every morning, they go and read the Danish newspaper. They live in Canada. Um, so it's very handy for them. But in 1993, to build a website, you had to write code like this. This is a CGI program written in C, and I must have written hundreds of these. Every time I needed to write a website, you had to write all kinds of code to decode form inputs and doing all the sort of the standard boilerplate stuff that you needed to do back then to write a website. And it wasn't very fun. And just to make a slight change in your HTML somewhere in here, you'd have to recompile your CGI program and redeploy it. That was no fun at all. Then most people at the time switched to using Perl because you don't have to recompile it, it just goes. But I wasn't extremely happy with Perl for two reasons. One, you had to fork and exec your web server in order to execute the Perl <laughs> interpreter. The Perl interpreter running on 1993 hardware 
was really not pleasant. Um, and especially for every single request, you have to fork and start up the Perl interpreter. And it took a good second before we even got started running our program. So the latency on web pages was terrible. And the other thing I didn't like about this was programming HTML. I mean, you have to kind of write a program that spits out HTML. And to me, HTML was, it's not a language, but it's its, its own thing. You should be able to have IDEs and WYSIWYG editors that just understand HTML, and that's what you should be using to design your pages. If you have to encode all your HTML inside a Perl script, that just wouldn't work. And I didn't want to be the guy designing the HTML pages and making things look nice, because I suck at that. I wanted to hand that off to other people, and I couldn't hand off a Perl program to them, because they would mess it up. So I wanted something that looked more like this, right? I wanted to, the HTML should look like HTML. You shouldn't program one language in another language. It's just not a good idea. And I wanted it to just be very, very simplistic and dynamic. So when you want some dynamic data, just drop in a tag, and that's it. You don't have to think about it very much. So basically a templating system. Um, and it, this wasn't a super new idea. I mean, there were other people working on template systems like this back in 1993-94. But this was the one that caught on with people for a number of reasons. So, I mean, and when you say caught on, it has really caught on. Right? About a third of the web is in PHP these days. And I think the reason it caught on that effectively was I didn't focus that much on the language as many people will lament to today, and I get lots and lots of criticism about the, fa the fact that I didn't concentrate that much on the language. But if I had spent all my time making the perfect language, it would never have gotten done, and it would never have gotten out there. If you count the number of languages written by computer science PhDs that are actually in use today, very few, right? Does Guido? Maybe Guido has, I'm not even sure he has a PhD in it, but I mean, Larry Wall certainly doesn't, Matt certainly doesn't. Um, so there's a bit of pragmatism involved in, in doing something like this, because there are so many problems to solve in order to actually put something in the hands of people that they can deploy into production and it'll just work. And you need the entire ecosystem. The nitty-gritty syntax of the language itself is a very, very small part of the overall end-to-end -end system of taking a web browser request, handling it, hitting a database of some kind, taking that data out, and then serving it up. And there's a whole series of technologies that you need it in there. You need an operating system, Linux in most cases, or FreeBSD. You need a web server. Then you need decent integration between these different layers, and you need a decent integration between Apache and PHP in this case. So my main focus was on solving the problem, and it was on each of these components and hooking them all together and writing whatever glue code I needed to get from one layer to the next. So I had to figure out how to write an Apache module. I had to embed PHP into the web server because I didn't want to fork an exec and wait for this entire, the very, very expensive context switch to get going. So I spent a lot of time playing with Apache and this was pre-Apache. And as soon as Apache came along, I was one of the first people to actually work with the Apache API and, and help develop that as well to, to solve this problem of having this barrier between these two sections be as efficient as possible. Then you also have to worry about robustness, performance, and security of these different layers. Um, I pushed very, very heavily for the pre-fork model as opposed to going threaded. Um, just because it's just way more efficient. We're never going to have perfect software. We're always going to have seg faults. If our server process crashes and it's handling a thousand threads, that's really bad news. If, just, if it's all process-based, one process dies, okay, all the other processes are still there serving up requests, way more robust. I'm a firm believer or unbeliever in threading for any sort of complex applications like this. Also, I had to worry a lot about shared hosting ISPs because back then most people were on a shared host where the shared host was trying to stuff thousands and thousands of people onto the same web server box. And 
making sure that the ISPs had the tools they needed to <coughs> deploy safely so that they could have memory limits, um, C CPU time limits, and things like that, so they could somewhat safely put <coughs> thousands of people on the same machine without these people interfering with each other. And then the other part is scaling. <coughs> so scaling up is kind of a, I wouldn't say it's an easy problem, but it's a, a logical thing that as, as technical people, we love to think about scaling up. How do we make this bigger and faster? I think what we often get wrong is that we don't know how to scale down. We don't think so much about going the other direction. And I, I don't mean going slower and not scaling. I mean, sort of, how do we get to the point where we can get the weekend warrior who has a great idea but has absolutely no idea how to program? Or if he has an idea how to program, it's the wrong idea. He has no clue how to do it correctly. <laughs> and in most cases, we as sort of geeks say, well, the guy is stupid. He's doing it wrong. We're just going to give him a really annoying error message and say, you're an idiot. Go away. And that's what most languages do. They give an error message to say, you're an idiot, go away. Right? I really, really didn't like that. In order for the web to grow, we need these folks. We need these folks who can't program, but have great ideas. If only geeks were allowed to put stuff on the web, the web would suck. <laughs> right? It would appeal to geeks, and it would be our own little echo chamber, and it would not be interesting at all. The web is interesting because it's all inclusive. Everyone can put stuff on the web. And that was part of the mission behind PHP. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think this last point is scaling both directions, thinking about all the way down to so the least experienced person around, and also writing something that can run Yahoo, Facebook, Wikipedia in the same code base. That is not easy. And a lot of criticism from both ends will come your way if you try to solve both problems in one go. Well, that's kind of what we try to do with PHP. So I talk mostly about this. I mean, created mod PHP to span this barrier between the web server and PHP itself. For scaling up the share nothing sandbox model, which a lot of people have complained about over the years, I can't remember the number of times that people wanted PHP to turn into an application server so that you could keep state so you could load in stuff, keep state, so that on the next request, you wouldn't have to rebuild that state. But I fought that hard, year after year. Like, we do not want to keep state in PHP. We do not want to add a scaling problem to PHP. Because every request is completely discrete and independent from the next, there is no scaling issue in PHP. The, scaling, the scalability issue is pushed down to the data store where it belongs. So if you need to scale, you need to keep state across multiple servers, while well, you need to look at MySQL replication, Postgres, Oracle, Memcache, any one of these technologies that are focused on solving that problem. I did not want that to become my problem. I had enough problems to solve. So by being very, very strict about the shared nothing um, architecture, it allows us to scale up to the biggest sites in the world. Um, and the limit clause fell out of this work as well. I was working with databases that you send a query across to it, and if you got the query slightly wrong, your page would basically hang because it's sitting there loading hundreds of thousands of rows back into, um, from the server sending it over the wire to the client. And the database I was working with at the time, MiniSQL, didn't have cursors or anything like that. It had no way to limit how many rows you were going to get on a query. So I thought that was nuts. And I said, well, OK, let's just limit it. right? So let's, let's stick a limit 10. So I know I do, I'll never want more than 10 rows anyway, because I'm only going to show the first 10. So if there's 100,000, what's the point? Let's just load the first 10. It seemed like an obvious thing. Um, and that was part of the, the performance work. All right, another aspect that I think about a lot these days is what are we actually doing with the web? So I worked a lot on technologies to scale things down and to scale things up and to make it all inclusive. 
And sometimes when I take a break and look around to see what these 244 million websites running PHP are actually doing, it's a little bit depressing. <laughs> <laughs> because you could remove 243.9 million of those and the world would not be any worse off. <laughs> There's a lot of sites that it's just, it really doesn't matter if they exist or not, and it's mostly time wasters. Um, I would love to see people focusing a little bit more on doing stuff that actually matters to the world, and Silicon Valley especially these days, it's very depressing. Um, I've done some advising for various VCs, and I've sat in some of these VC funding meetings, and I used to see people coming in with great ideas, one after the other. And it's a little depressing to then listen to the money guys discuss what they should fund and what they shouldn't fund. It seems the folks that come in with ideas that would seem to make a difference to the world are not getting the money. Um, and that's a little bit depressing. But the thing that looks like a Pinterest clone gets millions of dollars, and do we really need another Pinterest? One is more than enough. <laughs> <coughs> so, and I've also come to realize, in, in doing all this stuff, people always ask me, well, so how does it feel to build something that runs a third of the web and millions and millions of people use? It doesn't really affect me that much. It's it doesn't seem like I've accomplished anything, to put it that way. It, it doesn't seem like it has made the world a better place. I travel a lot, many different countries give talks like this, and on my way from the airport to the hotels, you look out the window, and some of these countries, you see what you're driving through, and it's just really, really depressing. And you end up at the hotel, talk to a bunch of geeks, give the same spiel, drive back to the airport and you just drive through filth the whole way and people living in absolute misery. And it just seems like we could do a little bit better if we just take a little bit of our brain power towards some of these efforts. Um, but it's hard. And it's one of these things that we can't necessarily solve by tapping away at our keyboards continuously. I feel like I've run out of things that I can solve simply by sitting behind my keyboard in a dark room and not sort of venturing outside and looking at the world. And one of the things that I've been trying to do is I currently work for Etsy, and I've been trying to push Etsy into developing markets, people that don't necessarily have access to computers or the internet or anything like that, but have a rich history of crafts making and things like that, and actually going in and trying to figure out how do we get someone in the middle of rural Mexico online? And how do we get them to sell their amazing crafts that go back hundreds and hundreds of years? Or how do we go into really poor countries in Africa and do the same thing? And this is the kind of thing that <coughs> I can't sit down and write another PHP extension, like the Africa extension or the rural Mexico <laughs> extension that just solves this problem. And there's so many times over the years, I'll just write another extension and I'll add another 200 functions to the global namespace in PHP, problem solved, right? <laughs> this is much, much, much harder. And it's amazingly hard for a geek, actually. You, you start looking at, well, okay, these people have no internet access, they have no way to get online. All my tools I have at my fingertips can't reach them. I actually have to travel there, I have to talk to them. Then you have to deal with the local government because you end up stepping on people's toes when you try to go in and give people things or help them do things because there are government programs that try to do the same thing, you end up in this political mess, and it's quite amazing, actually, how hard things are. We have it really easy as geeks, if we sort of limit our world to this little geeky world that we live in, that we can just sit quietly behind our keyboards and we can solve anything that we think is important. And I just think that we need to think a little bit bigger. We've done some amazing things over the years with the internet. And we discuss some amazingly trivial things on the internet as well. The amount of flames and things that I get regularly for basically putting out code for everyone to use for free, it's like I personally insulted them by doing that. 
and sometimes I think like, wait a second, what are we doing? What, why are we doing this? And the flame wars between the Python people and the Ruby on Rails people and PHP people, and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We have it really, really good compared to other people in the world. And we've done some amazing things with, with this brain power we have. If we could just kind of focus things on what's important and stop infighting and stop doing stupid things to each other. Um, and think about what else we can do. I think that could be a really, really nice thing for our community as well. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions as well. Um, if you want to know more technical parts of PHP, come to my talk yesterday. <laughs> some, of, some of you managed to do that, so your time machine was working. Um, so, but I, I can take a couple of questions if you want technical stuff. We can spend a little bit of time on that. I'm sure there are a few things you guys are interested in hearing. Yes? What was the <coughs> initial reaction, the initial build up when you created PHP as, as an open source project? Um, how did that, like, how did the initial part of the community building go? <coughs> so, to build a community in, in, well, it changes over the years, but back then, everyone was flailing around trying to solve the web problem. And nobody really had a good handle on how to do that correctly. I think the fact that I worked like crazy for the first couple of years to build a tool and an ecosystem that actually solved all the parts of this problem that people could just stick on their server and it worked, that kind of built the community. You have to get the project over this hump where it's easier for people to take your hack and fiddle with it slightly and solve your problem that way than it is for you to rewrite it from scratch. Right? Sometimes you see open source projects that only get like sort of 10% of the way there. And it's too damn hard to take that 10% and then add 90% to it because first you have to learn the quirks of the 10%. It's easier just to write that 10% yourself. You have to get to the point where it just becomes easier to fix the three bugs that you see in the thing and then reuse it, submit those three bugs back. And it's very much sort of a, a self-centered approach to it that I have a problem I want to solve. I need a tool that can solve it. I need a hammer. Hey, this hammer can do it or can do most of my problem. Let's just take this hammer and improve it slightly. So I didn't do anything to build a community. I put a tool out there that worked. And then people took the tool and said, well, cool, I'm going to use it. But in the process of using it, they needed to fix it slightly. So the only community building I did was I was open to suggestions and patches. And at a certain point, I was just getting flooded with patches. Because in the first couple of years, I would rewrite everything. They would send me a patch, I would look at it, and I got, that's not how I would do it. And I would rewrite it and put it in. And the result was that people felt a little bit disenfranchised. They didn't feel like they were part of the process because I kind of took over and did everything. So at a certain point, I basically said, okay, I'm not going to put my sort of stamp on everything. I'm just going to open up the repository. Anybody can commit. And then I sort of assigned owners to the various parts. The guy who'd been complaining for years about my Oracle extension, I would just, it's yours now. Stop complaining to me about this. Every bug that comes in on Oracle is yours at this point, right? Um, and I gave him ownership. And, and people getting ownership, then things started to improve quite a bit because they weren't always yelling at me. And they started also to defend the code a little bit themselves, which was nice. Yes? I, I would like to thank you for those tools because I tell you what, um, I work with PHP and as a late I've been forced to work with Cold Fusion. Cold Fusion does not have the ability to take an array and properly encode it into a JSON object. And then I have to do the work on the um, client side and properly format <laughs> your JSON encode. I don't know if you wrote that, but that does that beautifully right. in well, I mean, Cold Fusion, Cold Fusion doesn't do it because it's ancient and outdated and it, it was invented. I mean, it hasn't progressed since JSON came about, basically, right? So that's why there's no JSON support in it. It's not really well, maybe I alive. Be, maybe I should be 
critical, but I really just missed that one. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. But then there's something else will come along that it also won't support. You kind of cold fusion is that it is way past the end of its road. You kind of have to get over it. I can't put that on my resume. I know. Yes. Sure. Well, it seems like. You know, the reason it doesn't work is because it doesn't have the community on it, right? True. Oh, it's a commercial project, so yeah. You talked a little bit about, you know, building this PHP community. I'm wondering, um, like, if you can think of, I'm, I'm really curious about this stuff that you're doing right here. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, the PHP works because you wrote it well, but then you also got the community involved. And so can those same ideas somehow be applied to these other issues? That well, that's what I'm hoping. I mean... I didn't have any clue how to write a language when I started PHP. I still don't really have a clue how to write a language. <laughs> and it didn't matter. My focus was on solving the problem. By whatever means necessary, I would just bash away at the problem until it died, basically, and until I won. <laughs> and it, it was stubbornness. It was not brain power or experience or anything like that, I had absolutely no idea how to build this and how to solve that problem. It was just sort of mashing away at it. And since it worked for that field, why can't it work for other fields? That's kind of my attitude. How hard can it be? And it turns out it's hard, but unless you try, I mean, you're never going to get anywhere unless you actually start whacking at it. Yes? Okay, so most of us, we solve these little problems not by choice, but because we've got a job and a family to support. Right. Given those constraints, how can we part of, become part of this community to solve the problem? What Go work for companies that aren't Pinterest. <laughs> Go work for companies who actually has that as, as, as sort of a logical progression. For Etsy, for example, if we can get all the artists in Africa and rural Mexico to sell stuff online, we'll still take our 3% or whatever the percentage is. I mean, it's still part of the business. It's a little harder to get into, but it's not completely outside the scope of the business, right? And I think there are lots and lots of companies out there. If, if you think about where is Facebook's next billion customers going to come from, the next billion users, pretty much everybody with a computer and online today has a Facebook account. Where's the next... Where's, where's the 100% growth going to come from? It's going to come from people who don't have computers today and actually get online. So... Facebook might have an interest as well in getting these folks online. All these people that we, with this Etsy project, I'm going in and giving them their first computer or their first smartphone and showing them how to use it, their next step might be to download the Facebook app and get online. We might be creating more Facebook users that way. And there are other companies that are sort of in the same boat where it is in their best interest to be the first big player in some of these developing markets. Yes, back there. You mean on, in the PHP world or in? Even, even if it's just a, nothing more than an extension to a, to a browser, it, it seems to me that if, if that's the limit, then stepping into. I, I think you took my, my keyboard comment a little literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, for PHP, we're solidly a server side language. We're not kind of we're not looking to be the programming environment on Android or being sort of a a single stick USB stick type of application you just plug in somewhere. So no, we're not really looking to to move out of our sort of sweet spot that we're in at the moment. I think other technologies are better suited for for things like that. You're still always going to need some kind of server side mechanism that is the, the gateway between the client request and your big back-end database. So PHP is kind of the front end of the back end, if you will, whereas there are many front end front ends out there, JavaScript, CSS, all kinds of things, um, and client-side languages as well. We're not looking to move. Yes? So I don't know what happened before, but the last couple of years, PHP has been evolving at a lot faster pace. Yeah. It's nice for developers. My question is, are you, are you going to be able to continue that, continue that, you know, evolution pace that's been really nice? 
If we get some help, yes. Um, we got stalled a little bit on the Unicode effort, which was mostly my fault. Um, Unicode sucks. It's really hard to get this stuff right, and we tried to do too much too fast with the Unicode effort for PHP 6, and we just got stuck. And that slowed down the development process. Developers were getting confused. They couldn't follow because the code got really complex, and developers just started going, oh, that's, this is too hard for me. I, I'm going to go play with something else. So the speed up you saw was actually just back to the regular pace after I killed PHP 6. And I went backwards and said, okay, let's take small steps. We're still going to get there, but we're not going to take one giant leap. We're going to take small hops along the way. And the developers kind of came rushing back because now they could see these small steps along the way. <laughs> and it worked much better. Yes? Perl and PHP are quite similar. Was that an accident or did you use this Perl spec for Not an accident at all. Um, PHP is not a religion. It's not a new language. It's just a tool. And as a tool, I wanted to use things that people were familiar with. At the time, 1993-94, Perl and C were the two dominant languages that people used. So PHP looks a lot like Perl and C. I didn't want people to learn something new. If you're going to build a hammer, make it look like a damn hammer. <laughs> don't try to come up with something that doesn't look like a hammer, because chances are it won't work very well as a hammer, since people don't know how to use this weird thing. It might be way more efficient to hammer with your kneecap or something, right? But <laughs> people are used to hammering with their damn hands. So give them something that they're familiar with. Give them an interface that just works. I think I'm out. OK, last one, then I'm out of time. Yes? Uh, there's been a lot of PHP frameworks that have tried to add the whole MVC model and mm -hmm. everything. Do you ever see that converging on a single? No. We're not never going to have the one framework that solves everything because there are different problems out there. Not everyone has a general purpose framework problem. Nobody actually has a general purpose problem. Everyone has a very specific problem. What I'm hoping to see is way more fragmentation of frameworks down to targeted frameworks. And we, we have some of that. We have WordPress, for example. It's a, it's a framework for blogging type problems. We have various frameworks for uh, financial stuff or for s shopping cart things like Magento, for example. We have Drupal for content management. We have frameworks that target in on specific problems. And I'm hoping to get way more of that. So less general purpose framework and way more targeted frameworks. Thank you very much, folks. I'm done. So, yeah, wonderful first keynote. Thank you again very much. Um, so, kind of leading off from some of what you talked about with the community, we want to talk a little bit about the community that we have. So, I'm going to turn a few more minutes over to Victor Villa before our next uh, keynote so that he can talk about that. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, I think we had a good show this first day, and I hope that you also like this next show, the next day. Um, Isaac Newton said that if I was seen further, it's because I stood on the shoulder of giants. And Utah Open Source is very much the same way. Last year, in the conference, we had 481 attendees. This year, conservatively, we're estimating 840 so far with additional people walking in. Um, this presents huge challenges in scalability. Uh, not unsimilar to the scalability challenges you face today. Um, <clears throat> we've reached out to the Java community and they responded very earnestly. We've reached out to the Women Tech Council and they um, single-handedly launched the executive track in less than a month's time and absolutely phenomenal logistics. And if I can, just to thank Kristen, I'm not sure if she's made it in yet or not, but she's just been an excellent liaison with that community. Um, we've also welcomed the hardware community and the transistors and DC01. And all of these different communities tying in with ours and sharing with each other really benefits the whole. This, this hard work, working with Utah Open Source core team, is practically a part-time or a full-time job, and I'd like you to meet the actual core team. So,
representing the open source community now, I'd like to have the following people come up. Steve? No, come over here, please. Okay, James? Doran? Chase? <coughs> Joseph? <coughs> Steve's working. Um, Tyrell. Where is Tyrell? He did run away. So this is the active core team. But before you applaud them, there's one other thing that we need to do. Um, there's a special introduction that I'd like to do for this person. Um, she worked with the Utah Open Source team back when we were the Utah Open Source Conference. And for several years, she did a lot of design work. And the, she refined the concept of the Utah Open Source logo that you see today to what it is now. She co-designed the Open West logo with Sherry Bigelow. And she transitions to the Utah Open Source Alumni Association, which practically requires its own little number of calls because we work everybody to death. Velda, can you please join us? On behalf of the community, I sincerely thank you guys for your work. Alright, so, and of course Victor, he, he didn't quite put enough emphasis on what he means by full-time work. For those who don't know, Victor has been putting in amazing numbers of hours over the past couple months trying to get this thing together. And really, without his dedication and extreme sleep deprivation, this conference would have happened. So please give a hand again for Victor. <laughs> so the, the, the Utah open source community has been wonderful. We have many great groups doing a lot of work, and we're very grateful that everyone here that is participating throughout the year in those groups. But like you mentioned, um, and also Rasmus mentioned, with, with the scale of the group, um, as we've gone from 400 to 800, this conference has become a lot more difficult to manage, it's a lot more work. And we want to make sure everyone understood that you know, this core team that you saw up here, it's not some kind of exclusive group. It's the same as the rest of Utah Open Source, everything that's happening out there. If you have an interest in this conference, if you have ideas of how you would like to see it grow, please join us. Come join the core team. Help, help out. See what you want to have happen. It happens. We're, we're always available. We're, all of us have just stepped up at some various point with an idea saying, hey, I'd like to help out. And all of you are welcome to do the same. So please come join us and help make next year's conference even larger. Okay? So next I'd like to introduce our final keynote. Um, block the notes here. So obviously, talking about scaling, Facebook comes to mind. Um, they're they're a, a great example of taking open source projects, not just to a, a big data level, to, but to the level beyond that. Um, and also they're a great example of what a company can do by letting its employees enjoy geeking out in open source. Right? It, it's the people that can take a product, they can commit the code, they can make it better, but they can also participate in the community. They can share what they've learned. Now, this goes back to all the original Linux groups. We, we came because we loved what we were doing, because we had great ideas that, and enthusiasm for it that we wanted to share. And really, that's what the open source community is about. It's, this, it's ever since the early days in, you know, in Silicon Valley, when people first got together to share what they were learning with these new computers. Well, now we just have more, more options of what we can share and what we can discuss. And uh, I think Mark Callahan, who's a great person that we wanted to invite because he's been doing exactly this. As he's in his community, in his work, he's come up with a lot of great ideas and through blogging and through presentations, been able to share out 
some of these examples that we're then able to apply to our own work because we enjoy what we do. We enjoy these products. We enjoy the, the technical problems that we try and face. So Mark Callahan, he has been helping keep large my skill deployments uh, at Happy at Google and then Facebook for the last seven years. So he's, he's a very frequent blogger, blogger and active participant in my <coughs> community. So please welcome Mark Callahan. Thank you. And before I, before I get started on the, the MySQL part of my talk, this is the first time that I, I heard Rasmus talk. And, and also, Facebook is a big uh, beneficiary of his work on PHP. So it's a good time to thank him. Uh, I, it, it, it's unfortunate that you don't have the time machine. The, the talk he gave yesterday was very interesting, especially the a lot of his uh, descriptions of how you do performance debugging on PHP reminded me of a lot of the, uh, the work that we do uh, with, with MySQL. Uh, the other thing is I have a talk, I think it's at 2 p.m. today. It's, it would be a short presentation and then um, question and answer. And really the focus is on uh, question and answer after the presentation. Uh, I can't talk about product and policy because I don't know much about them. But I, I can tell you a lot about uh, how we use MySQL and how you're using MySQL and the, the roadmap for MySQL. So I, I hope you attend, and I will do my best to give my opinion on uh, your, your questions. I have been uh, making MySQL better for my employer since about 2006. Uh, this has been a really... Uh, great opportunity for me. It lets me telecommute from Central Oregon uh, since about 2007. The supply and demand for MySQL expertise uh, is definitely in, in the favor of individuals. So uh, when you get the skills, um, it, it gives you a lot of opportunity to, to do interesting work. Uh, the focus of my talk is, is my experience with MySQL. So um, the while the product has definitely improved over the past seven years, and, and a lot of companies and people have been responsible for that, um, since I'm talking about my experience, my, my focus is on the work that my teams have done. Uh, and I don't want to imply that we're the only teams that have been doing this. Definitely, uh, Oracle has led the way. I am a, officially a software developer, but I, I tend to straddle. Uh, production, so I deal a lot with DBAs and the, the problems we get in production, hands-on. Um, and then I spend a lot of time trying to make things better with what I've learned from that. So really, the, for me, the story of MySQL ha has two parts. And you need to be careful that there's a lot of negativity that comes from one of the parts. That, that um, be careful about letting that influence too much um, your perception of the technology. And really the drama is one part, technology is another. One can be interesting to read about as long as you're not personally involved in it. Um, the other one, the technology, is, is where I hope people focus. And, and so some of the drama came about from uh, the transition in ownership. Uh, MySQL was a pre-IPO startup. Uh, moving towards an IPO, uh, and, and in, instead of doing the IPO, they were acquired by Sun. It was a great outcome for the company. Uh, approximately $1 billion uh, sale. So a lot of people were able to get a return on, on their hard work. Uh, a few years after that, and, and that uh, acquisition was announced the week of the, user, the annual user conference for the MySQL community. A few years after that, Oracle acquired Sun. Again, I think that was announced the week of the, the MySQL user conference. Uh, reaction to these two different acquisitions was different. Uh, there was a lot of negative response in the community from the Oracle acquisition. Uh, fortunately, uh, the last few years, I th from a technology perspective, uh, the product has never been improved at a better rate um, until uh, uh, since the Oracle acquisition. So. As a steward of the technology, Oracle has, has done a great job. Um, separate from this, Oracle bought uh, the InnoDB storage engine, the company, uh, prior to acquiring Sun. And this was and is the uh, storage engine for MySQL. 
And so there was some concern about that. The Sun, I think this was during the Sun years, started another project, Falcon, that was supposed to compete with uh, NODB. Uh, unfortunately, the hype or the marketing for Falcon got far ahead of the technology and it, it never reached uh, general availability. And then um, the Oracle purchase of Sun was delayed in, in for uh, some concern with uh, having them own another database product uh, and eventually that was resolved. They made uh, public commitments to, to MySQL uh, for some number of years. Uh, I think uh, there was a five-year timeline on that, so that's expiring, but at, at this point in time, uh, the community is generally happy with things. Definitely there's uh, just right now, really the focus is on figuring out uh, how we can use the, the new features. Now for technology, uh, there are a lot of companies and individuals making the product better. It's defi definitely led by uh, MySQL, and sometimes I just say MySQL instead of Oracle, but they are leading the effort. Um, there are several, many other companies, including MariaDB, which is now a, a significant fork from uh, official MySQL. Uh, most of that development is done by Monty Program, which has recently announced a merger with SkySQL. Uh, Percona uh, are the high performance and NODB experts. And they have uh, a smaller, uh, a less, uh, a, a fork with fewer diffs. Uh, Facebook, and I'll describe later some of the, the features that we've pushed. We have some of our diffs that have made it into official MySQL. In other cases, we've, we think we've motivated other companies um, to solve some of these problems. Galera is a synchronous replication solution uh, for InnoDB, and it's in MariaDB and Percona. Uh, Continuant does replication products. One of the things that they did was uh, multi-threaded replication apply. SkySQL has been doing uh, lib client-side libraries with uh, uh, different licenses. And then uh, TokuDB was recently announced as open source. It's a write-optimized database engine. So really the, the big thing is that technology has come a long way and uh, a lot of companies are contributing to this. So how did I get here? I was doing database internals for Informix and Oracle for about nine years. I had never been near a production database during that time, which is probably typical for most people at the big database companies. I joined Google in late 2005. At the time, Google did not tell you what you would be working on until the first day of your job. So they definitely had the uh, reputation for being the place to work and people were willing uh, to put up with that risk. Uh, fortunately, they've since changed. So now um, they have to give you a, they're actually competing for people and, and so there's much more choice. So I ended up on a project that I did not want to be on. Um, a big reason to leave that project was that one of my coworkers was a highly productive genius. And I just did not want to be compared to him on an annual basis when it was promotion time. <laughs> um, so it was, and um, I had child number two, so I had some commitment at home. Um, and I had to find a new project. I was in ads engineering. We had a MySQL deployment. We actually had modified MySQL, but the people who did those changes moved on to other projects, and nobody was supporting the, the on the engineering side, nobody was uh, offering support. So it took about a day to figure out how to do the build, given the patches that we had applied, and I just moved on over and began to learn about the problems that we had. Uh, one of the big problems was that at the time, Google hired uh, generalists for operations. And for them, a generalist meant someone who knew everything about TCP and didn't necessarily know a lot about things like MySQL. Uh, if you knew a lot about MySQL, you were a specialist. So it, uh, I have memory, which I think is accurate, of being told a couple of times that query response time was poor because of TCP settings. That was the, the depth of support we had on the operations team. Um, we rapidly changed that. And we ended up with a fairly strong team at Google 
but late 2008, 2009, the team was advised to find new projects, meaning uh, the team would be no more. Uh, so I looked around. Uh, eventually, the MySQL user conference came about, and I, I found a new project, and it was at Facebook. And so this was the best career advice I ever received, and I, I don't think I've ever thanked Google for it, but um, definitely gave me motivation to, to join Facebook. <coughs> And it was definitely, for me, a time for a new challenge because the, um, the deployment we had at, at Google, it became kind of boring. There weren't so many fires to fight or crises to, to fix. And definitely, uh, at companies like this, uh, at times, um, the people who get noticed are the people who are solving crises. So if you do a really good job and the crises goes away, go away, then you better look around for, for new problems to solve. So uh, one of someone famous in the, the database industry as a researcher and as someone who starts companies uh, said at one point in time that uh, operating the clusters that we do for MySQL was a fate uh, worse than death. And the basis for this was uh, second or third hand knowledge. Um, the interesting thing was my brother worked at his company at the time. So we, we had a chat about it and eventually the uh, claim was uh, uh, owned up to for, for not being true. It was also a great way for me to meet this uh, famous person. Um, but there definitely have been some hard uh, problems to solve. And so really, I think my, the achievement that I'm proud of at, at Facebook is that um, I helped grow or build two really strong teams in engineering and performance. And then on the operations side, I've done a lot of recruiting. And I think I've recruited about uh, half of these various teams. Um, and so now I'm slowly stepping back and, and letting them grow and, and trying to do something new. Uh, standard question I get asked is why MySQL? Uh, I get that this a lot. And the, the first response is it was there when I started. It was true at Google and it was true at Facebook. For a lot of us, we don't get to choose the technology you can choose the, the experience you have, what technology are you expert in, but when you end up at a company, uh, in, in many cases, it's, it's already there. The second reason is why is it still there is that uh, we helped make it a lot better. So there were some crises over the past few years and we slowly reduced the rate at which these problems show up. The third point is we have great teams. Uh, you can't uh, overestimate the value of expertise in operations. Uh, so if you take a reasonably good tool, apply expert advice on how to use it, uh, the outcome is, is pretty good. And the final point is that right now MySQL is in a, is in a very good state. Uh, InnoDB, from my perspective, is world class for transaction processing. So just separating InnoDB from the rest of MySQL. It has fe a few features that I think are unique that perhaps other database implementations should consider. Uh, adding. Uh, the server is robust and from a simple definition of robust, does it crash and does it leak memory? Um, these are two problems that I, I usually don't get. Uh, the joke I make is that MySQL uh, never crashes and then product X, where just name some other database vendor, always recovers. And you can apply the reverse on that. But at this point, I, I think actually MySQL always recovers as well. So um, hopefully uh, and I'll get into some of the problems we get from that. Now, with respect to being very good today, there's some problems that we'll continually have to fix. Uh, hardware gets faster, we get more CPU cores, we get faster storage, Fusion I.O., um, some of the other flash vendors. We have a lot of work to do to get MySQL to keep up with them. And then replication still has problems we need, we need to fix for uh, large-scale sharded deployments. Another frequent question is why not something else? Uh, we do use some other things. Uh, HBase and HDFS are used at scale. We've had a uh, custom database service for photos and videos called Haystack. Uh, we definitely use a lot of memcache and then we've enhanced memcache into this thing that we call uh, Tau, which is an application server plus cache. Uh, but some of this comes down to a, a philosophical debate. So which, you know, which of these statements 
would you argue for? Use the right tool for the job, which is uh, polyglot persistence, or jack of all trades, master of none. And for me, I tend to come down on the second point, which is really uh, jack of all trades, master of none. If you use too many systems at scale, you're not going to have expertise in any of them. Uh, if you use anything at scale, you need an operations team that's on call. So they don't have to work 24 by 7, but someone has to carry a pager to, to handle that. So if you're introducing a new system, the first thing you need to do is either hire a new operations team, five or six people, or make an existing team responsible for that new system. Operations uh, people are hard to find in the Bay Area. And if you hand off this uh, support to an existing team, they're not going to have expertise in it. And if you want to run the system with high throughput, uh, a, if your philosophy at work is move fast, so the workload changes rapidly, uh, and you want a reasonable quality of service, you need expertise. And so I, I tend to think that we're better off at the large companies of reducing the number of systems that we operate. And the final point is that we don't want to go sideways. So any time that we're considering a migration to a, to a new service, um, you have to consider the cost of moving and the benefits, as well as the, the opportunity costs that you're not going to be building uh, higher value features um, with the people who are dedicated to doing the migration. So the, the MySQL workload that we have, we call it social graph transaction processing. We've actually released an open source benchmark that we call LinkBench, which has an implementation for MySQL. Um, we think that this can be re-implemented using drivers uh, for a variety of relational databases and, and possibly for uh, other document-oriented document databases. Um, the intent was really to interest the academic community in the type of workload that we're supporting. And I suspect that some of the different uh, database vendors will um, begin publishing some performance results for this. Um, but I definitely don't want to be in the middle of uh, evaluating whether the uh, results are reasonable b between the products. For the workload that we have, um, it's definitely dominated by short range scans. About 50% of the queries are range scans that return 10 to 20 rows. Joins are infrequent. For me, a join is um, between a secondary index and then scanning a secondary index and then doing point lookups on the primary key. Online schema change is frequent, and it's so frequent that we wrote a framework for doing it so we can do it in place and without blocking the workload. We don't have to take servers down. We don't have to uh, add additional hardware to handle this. Workload is read intensive. We have a lot of cache, but we're, um, the cache is just not sufficient to capture this. Transactions are short, and long-running queries, excluding daily backup and ETL, are, are rare. Uh, the big thing for me is IOPS, although this has changed over time. So the working set doesn't, does not fit in RAM. We're read intensive. And in the past, we've been buying servers to get more uh, random disk reads and disk writes. <coughs> With the introduction of Flash, it's definitely changing. So it's, for us, it's a good change, although at, ti at times um, there's not as many problems to solve. So it's, it's definitely made things less exciting. Um, in addition to Flash, the big improvements, uh, changing in the indexes so we had more covering indexes on our, our queries. We used to go from having queries that would do 10,000 disk reads in the worst case, and now we're down to three or four. Uh, this uh, rollout of covering indexes, meaning we had to change the indexes we had defined in production, was a big motivation for getting the online schema change framework to work. Uh, we've added a lot of monitoring and uh, ended up deploying, I think we're the large, one of the few and large uh, deployments of InnoDB table compression. So my humble brag slide, some of the metrics are distorted by daily backup. So in those cases, we distinguish uh, the peaks that occur during daily backup versus not. Uh, we're doing about 50 million queries per second. Uh, we're doing, um, 6 billion rows read per second with daily backup, 2 billion rows read per second without. Um, with and without daily backup, we're doing 20 million or 40 million uh, disk operations per second. And that includes uh, flash 
in, on some of our, our database servers. Our response times are, are between one and two milliseconds. Uh, we have many petabytes in the database clusters. I'm, I won't be exact about that. And we have more than 1,000 database machines. And, and I, I tend to be vague on the machine count. So I started 2006 uh, with MySQL 4.0. It didn't do well with more than four cores or one socket. Uh, there was very little monitoring. So if you try to de debug workload problems, you were going to spend a lot of time. Uh, slave replication state wasn't crash proof. If MySQL D crashed or the server rebooted, we would frequently have to reload from a, a backup. And the 5.0 release was available, but it was, uh, it was buggy. And then compare that to MySQL 5.6 today. Releases have been on time. They've been high quality. Benchmark results are, are very impressive. Uh, these are some results that I get from a 24, a 24 core server. I can do 400,000 queries per second. I can do uh, 150,000 page reads per second, assuming fast storage. Uh, performance scales beyond 32 cores. A lot of this, or most of this, is due to, to huge, huge improvements within NODB. And a lot of that has been led by Oracle, but there's definitely been motivation from uh, Percona and Facebook and Google and other companies pushing on making the product better. Replication now. Um, the most recent release should be crash proof for slave state, so no more restores after a slave crashes. Global <coughs> transaction IDs will eventual, eventually lead to products that automate failover of slaves, so hopefully a, a DBA doesn't have to wake up with a page when a server crashes. And replication apply is multi-threaded, uh, which will do a lot to overcome replication lag. So this is just an example of the uh, the change. Uh, very simple benchmark. It's just doing point lookups, read only. But the, uh, the yellow curve is MySQL 5.6, and it's what you want to say. Linear improvement until the saturation point is reached, at which point it's flat. Uh, MySQL 4.0 just doesn't do much uh, with more threads. It very quickly saturates and doesn't go anywhere. So uh, this is really key for letting us get the uh, capacity in the, the new multi-core servers that many of us are running and allows us to focus on other problems rather than you know, why are we spending so much money on database hardware. How did we get here? Uh, I think the big thing was uh, this was led by Oracle. Um, I highlight many of the other companies in the community that have uh, motivated Oracle to to uh, fix some of the problems. Uh, MariaDB led a lot of the improvements in the optimizer. Oracle responded. Percona did a lot to make InnoDB better. Oracle responded. And so there's a pattern here where we have to do things at times first in the community. And since I'm not in the, I'm not part of the product planning within, or within Oracle, I do think that we're giving them motivation to match the improvements we're doing within the community. Um, this is really my timeline, so it's not all of the improvements that have been done to the product. Uh, I started in 2006. We published the patch at Google in 2007 that did a lot to fix uh, replication and provide much better monitoring. Uh, in 2008, we rewrote the read-write lock, which was eventually accepted by Oracle into the product. 2009, we published the patch for global transaction IDs. Now the similar behavior is available in 5.6. Uh, I left for Facebook in 2009, 2010, just a lot of time heads down porting changes from the Google patch to the Facebook patch. Uh, we implemented online schema change. 2011, uh, after three attempts, I eventually implemented group commit. Uh, we had it first, and then Monty program with MariaDB <laughs> did a separate version, which is much better. Uh, 2012, did a lot of work with Oracle to fix drop table stalls. We used drop table a lot during schema change, and it was locking up a server for one second, which is lousy. Uh, so we figured out how to make that fast. 2013, now we've been porting uh, to 5.6. We continue to work on NODB compression, um, and we're working on read ahead to make uh, logical backup almost as fast as doing a file backup. So some things you can do, uh, and this is not whether or not you have any interest in MySQL, be excellent at what you do. If you're great, uh, 
the technology that you know is more likely to be used by the companies who really have a hard time hiring people with background in, in the various technologies. The second is write about your experiences. I blog a lot, and, and I think you don't need a profound blog post to be useful. You know, the standard pattern is, I had a problem, this is what I did, it made things better, or it made things worse. Uh, it's a great resource. We end up using Google or Bing to find these posts. And uh, the final point, which uh, Rasmus um, talked about in his talk yesterday, um, use early releases, file good bug reports, don't flame in the bug report, um, even if it's Oracle, the owner, rather than volunteers, uh, write, write a good bug report. It's valuable. And uh, use the early releases. Um, as part of preparation for this talk, I went over some of my history. Uh, being in the public, uh, working on open source means your work product is in the public. Uh, we have over a thousand uh, diffs to our local repos and we do push them. Our 5.1 repo is in Launchpad, 5.6 is in GitHub. I have almost 400 blog posts from my personal blog and from the Facebook page. Uh, over half a million page views. The one thing I've noticed is anything I write about MongoDB um, tends to get many more page views than anything I write about MySQL. Um, it makes me sad at times because I'm not a MongoDB expert. Um, and anything I post at Facebook will get more page views just because we have a larger audience and we have a larger audience because I'm allowed to use Facebook in the, the page name. So people see that and sometimes they use that as a channel to tell me what's broken in Facebook which um, I tend to ignore because I don't know a product. I've uh, updated or filed more than 1,620 bugs on uh, bugs.mysql.com. One of the things I do a lot is um, update bugs, and then I write about them because I'm trying to motivate the vendor to make the product better. It's just the relationship we have. There's open source, but there's a bit of a wall between the company and the rest of us, and so we have to sometimes lob things over the wall. And unfortunately, when you throw something over the wall, sometimes there's collateral damage with the people who are not happy that you publicly drew attention to their, their bug that has been there for a few years. But it's just, in this community, that's the relationship we have at times. Uh, there's a lot of respect, but um, you do need to speak up. And internally, I've also filed a lot of tasks and bugs for myself and my team and the applications that use us internally. Um, to fix. But my biggest um, thing that I did is I uh, trained 14 developers to get productive at making MySQL better. It's very hard in the US to find someone with exp expertise in MySQL internals. And the only solution is to train people. Uh, blog post by me from year uh, 2009 when I switched companies was definitely the high point when I was very active. And I'm slowly transitioning from Facebook notes back to my personal blog. Diffs by year, we had two spikes when we were doing a lot of porting. And you can see 5.0 work ended quickly. We had a few good years with 5.1, and now all of our effort is on 5.6. What comes next? Uh, the never-ending story of making MySQL faster to match hardware. For InnoDB, we're trying to do online defragmentation. Uh, we have work to do better compression. We ended up, recent changes let us compress about a third of our database from one half to one third of its original size. We're trying to make uh, logical backup I.O. efficient, meaning get rid of disk seeks that are being done. Uh, a lot of the crises are past, so now we're getting back to focusing on quality of service. Uh, for that, the first step is to monitor it. What is your response time? And then um, can you drill down by statement type and by database account? And then the next step is to figure out how to improve it, assuming you have a high priority user and lower priority users. How can you uh, shed load on the lower priority users to make the high priority users better? And then we're trying to do something to uh, not do synchronous replication, but we want to archive the bin log synchronously within the same rack. So we'll have every committed transaction on two hosts uh, to improve the likelihood that we would not lose a committed transaction. And again, I have a talk at 2 p.m. Hopefully, I'll get a lot of questions. Uh, thank you for attending.
Thank you. Enjoy the classes today.